Bibles to 1 Peter. Come to a turning point in this letter. So far we've just been hearing Peter speak the greatest and glorious reality of our salvation. And now we come to the imperatives, um, the rest of the body of the letter. Although it has things that God has done, it is going to now say what we must do, what we must do. But there's a lot to understand before we just say, all right, let's get to work, as we will see as we go. Uh, we're going to read verses 13 through 21. This is a whole section. I don't think I'll complete that entire exposition today, so we'll probably pick it up at another time. But let's begin in verse 13. Peter writes, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy." And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you." Who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. This is God's holy word. Let's pray. Our Father, now we come to hear from you through the proclamation of the gospel, of the good news of grace in Christ to all who will repent and believe. Thank you for giving us such a clear word. I pray today as we turn the corner now to these imperatives, these commands, that we'd have the right mindset. We'd be doing these things out of the right motivation and in the way in which you only make possible. It is through Christ's empowering grace that we might pursue holiness with our entire being. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to be talking about holiness. Hope results in holy living. Hope results in holy living. I think you saw that in the first imperative is to set your hope fully. And in the last verse of that section I just read, it is so that your faith and hope are in God. Hope is a big theme here, but at the center of it is holiness. Hope, trusting in God, will result in something, and that is determined described as holiness. Now, holiness, the term itself, has fallen on hard times. We have a few things going against us in, in terms of trying to understand this. First, the way it's used in our culture. The term is just thrown around so flippantly. Think about the, some of the terms. Holy mackerel, holy Toledo, holy cow, holy smoke, holy roller, people are called. No wonder why people are so impressed when we talk, unimpressed when we talk about holiness. Then we have also the fact that holiness in the church has so been mischaracterized and misunderstood to the point where holiness actually just becomes some things you don't do. If you remember the 19th century movement, the American holiness movement, national holiness movement. Here's what they thought holiness was, coming out of the Methodist group. You could not go to the theater. You couldn't go to ball games. You couldn't play cards. No dancing. No makeup and lipstick, no curling or coloring one's hair, no tobacco or alcohol, no Coke, Coca-Cola, no chewing gum, no rings or bracelets or any form of so-called worldly ornamentation. You couldn't go to any fairs, those are county or state fairs, no political party involvement, no labor union meetings, and life insurance was a lack of trust in God. Is that your understanding of holiness? If it is, Peter wants to blow that up. Peter is going to give us a vision for what holiness is. 
And he will show us that it is a privilege. It is beautiful. It is wonderful. And it is something to be pursued with passion. And so that's my prayer this morning, that whatever you've been pursuing in the name of holiness will be redirected to the biblical truth found in this letter. And if you haven't been pursuing a holiness at all, that today you'd say, this is it, I'm done. I'm gonna, I see completely that if I'm trusting in Christ my Savior, it will result in holiness. Now, just to begin, to properly understand holiness, we must get what I often speak of as the grammar of the gospel. Okay, the grammar of the gospel, Pastor Ron spoke a little bit of this last week. And that is that before we do anything, before we can fulfill any sort of command, the scriptures point us to what God has done. And that comes out in this first word in verse 13, therefore. Therefore, preparing your minds for action. Therefore. That goes back to what we just covered in verses 1 through 12. And what was found there, we have God's electing grace exploding on the scene with Him causing us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ, something He's done in history now we hope and trust in. And it is to an, an inheritance that is undefiled, imperishable, unfading, waiting for us, being kept guarded for us who believe through faith. And it is this great salvation spoken of here that it is the prophets longing to understand it. It is angels peering into how great and glorious it is. This is wonderful. It's all by God's grace. And then he says, therefore, preparing your minds for action. Okay, this is the grammar of the gospel. It's all throughout the Bible. Paul does it. He starts with, let me talk about what God has done done for you in grace. Now, respond accordingly. What God has done takes precedence before humans do anything. That is the essence of Christianity. If you get this wrong, if you flip-flop it, you're going to find yourself in some real trouble. Legalistic denominations, oppressive religious movements, and dangerous cults are built on the foundation of a reversal of this sequence. Do this and God will be favorable. Do this and you will be blessed. Do this and then you will be right with God. That is not how, what the Bible teaches and it will end in damnation. Instead, the picture is God acting in His sovereign grace has brought about salvation in your own heart, raised you to life, and now with that life pulsating through your body, you live a life that pleases God. So we've got to get the grammar of the gospel, and so I, I, I'm going to be looking at these exhortations. There's three of them in this passage. We're going to be looking at them in light of what God has done. So these three exhortations flowing from glorious indicatives. One, be hopeful in God. Two, be holy like God. And three, be reverent before God. We won't get to the third one today. We'll pick that up after our series in the Psalms. But all of this comes together to show that hope results in a holy life. Hope is the root. Holiness is the fruit. So let's begin. Let's look at this first exhortation flowing from glorious indicatives. Verse 13, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's one main verb here in this sentence. It is set your hope fully. Then there are modifying participles, which is preparing your mind for action and being sober-minded. So we could literally translate it Therefore, after all that's been said, hope fully, set your hope fully on grace. And you do that by preparing your mind for action and being sober-minded. Those two things actually modify and fuel 
hope. So let's look first at hope. What is hope? We spoke about this earlier in our series. You've been born again to a living hope. Hope we described as a confident expectation in the fulfillment of the promises of God. But I want you to see that hope is essentially from the same substance as faith, belief. Belief is trusting God in the present. We're trusting that Christ did this and that we've been saved by him. Hope is trusting in what God will do, what he's yet to do in the future. Do you see that? So they're both one and the same. We hope in God that, according to this, grace will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then it says here, hope, set your hope fully. That is completely unreservedly could be translated perfectly you're not holding anything back you are setting your hopes fully on the grace to be given to you and how does this come about how do we actually trust him well we're thinking about what has god done in the past who is god has he not proven himself to be faithful all the promises for the old testament given to his people that he, we find fulfilled now in Christ. He has then saved us by redeeming us, drawing us to himself. Can he be trusted for what he will do in the future? Absolutely. What he has done here causes us to hope and trust in his future work at the return of Christ Jesus. But what are we hoping in? Look at this carefully. It says, set your hope fully on the grace of that will be brought to you at the revelation of Christ. Now, the revelation of Christ, that's his second coming. So think about this very carefully. We have seen in verses 1 through 12 this inheritance spoken of. We have here the coming of Christ spoken of. But it's interesting that the focus here, what we're hoping in, what we're desiring, what we're looking forward to is grace. Isn't that interesting? Grace. Sometimes we get the idea that we're living our Christian life and all of a sudden when we make it to the end, we're going to be somehow like congratulated as if we earned something, as if we did it all in our own strength. That's not what's described here. It is actually you will make it to the end in perseverance and receive more grace at the end. And that grace will continue on forever and ever. That is the emphasis here. And so I want you to be thinking, how important is grace to your heart? How important is understanding that God has been gracious? Maybe you don't think you need grace. Maybe you don't think you need grace now. The focus here is that your hope set fully on God's grace. Now, think about this. This is for the believer. Someone who's trusting will receive grace at the revelation of of Jesus Christ. What about somebody who's not trusting? And so if you're a visitor with us or um, been coming for a while and, and you're just trying to figure Christianity out, I want to be very explicit here, very clear that Christ is returning and he will bring grace for all those who are believing and trusting and hoping in him. But if you are not hoping in him, there is something else he is bringing. And it's very clear in scripture Listen to 2 Thessalonians 1. He will bring gr relief to you who are afflicted, as well to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. The gospel is the good news of what Christ has done. It is what these believers are hoping in, that they've been born again. Christ has died on the cross for their sins so they can have a right standing before God and not have their transgressions counted to them, but be forgiven completely. But if you're not trusting and believing in this gospel, what is said to be brought to you is punishment and eternal destruction away from the Lord. It's horrible. It's terrible. So I want you to be one of these people who are hoping fully in the grace 
that will be brought to you. Now, how do we hope? What fuels this hope? And this is where it gets very practical. He says, therefore, prepare your minds for action and be sober-minded. Those two things are really what's fueling, what's driving our hope. They produce it. And so what does this mean? Prepare your minds for action. It's literally gird up your loins. So turn your gown into some running shorts. Basically, back then when they would do fighting or war or work, they'd have these long clothes and they'd have to grab them and bring them up and tuck them in their belt so they could move around freely. Well, he's talking about doing this with your mind. Prepare your minds for action. Prepare yourself. Be vigilant in thinking. And what is he describing here and how does this promote or produce hope? He's saying be sober mind in the truth, in the word of God. Why do I say that? Prepare your minds for action. We see it in two ways. One, look at verse 14 with me. In describing their former life, these believers, he says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So they at one time were ignorant. They didn't have the truth, and that truth then was producing or that, that lack of truth was producing in them passions that then were conforming them to the world. But now they have truth. And so he's saying, set your minds fully on the truth, which will then produce hope. Paul says something very similar in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. He says, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. It's literally having girded up your loins with truth. Stand, stand fast. Think upon deeply the word of God. He says in Romans 15, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. The word of God, when it's meditated upon, when it's focused upon, produces hope. The mind is the pathway to the heart. The mind, in taking in truth, then produces hope in our hearts. Secondly, he says, be sober. Be sober. And being sober-minded, it says, be sober, hope fully. Be sober, set your hope. Sobriety. Not necessarily talking about drunkenness here. It's being sober mentally and spiritually. What does that mean in real life? Well, it means don't let your mind be drinking in things that are going to dull your senses to the greatness and glory of Christ. Be sober-minded. Be alert. Focused. Do not intoxicate and numb the mind to spiritual reality. And you all know what those things are. You have to be aware because it might be different for all of us. What causes you to be dulled to the realities of spiritual living. You know them. What is it? Focusing on worldly possessions and power or comfort or entertainment. These things that take your heart away and dull you. Maybe it's drunkenness. Maybe it's an extra click here. Maybe it's scrolling through social media. Having hobbies that are, you're consumed with. What are they? I'm not trying to say all those things are bad. What I'm trying to say is you have to be realizing what causes you to lack sobriety so that you can't set your hope fully on the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is where this is at. The battle for hope, which results in holiness, starts in the mind. What are you thinking about? What are you dwelling upon? If you deal rightly with this, if you're dealing with the small sins that take away your spiritual perception, you won't fall into the bigger, greater, terrible sins. You cut it off right at the root. Deal with the heart. 
So that's the first exhortation. Be hopeful in God by preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. Second, the second exhortation that flows from these great indicatives is to be holy like God. God is the source of hope, and he's also the standard of holiness. So Peter exhorts these readers now with their hope set on God. If it's focused on his future coming, it's all there. You're sober-minded. Don't be drawn back to your former way of life. Don't be pulled and lured. Look what he says here. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Well, what is holiness? Now we're getting to a meaning, a definition, some understanding here. Holiness means to be separate, to be set apart. We see this in imagery in the Old Testament. You think of the Sabbath day as being set apart. These are things being separated from either being what is defective and evil, and it's separated for God. So separate for a purpose to God. You have the Sabbath day, you have priests are holy to the Lord, set apart from ordinary pursuits and dedicated in a special way to the Lord. Now, how do we apply that then to God? Because here is the main thing here. Be holy as I am holy. So how do we apply this to God? What does it mean when we say God is holy? Well, he is set apart. There's no doubt about that. God is set apart from evil. He's unstained with moral compromise. He always does what is right. So that's one aspect of holiness, but there's another one. God is described as holy in the sense that he is absolutely unique. He is unrivaled. He is the only creator, the only sustainer, the only redeemer. 1 Samuel 2, 2, there is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides thee, nor is there any rock like our God. He's utterly set apart in a class by himself. How do we understand then other terms applied to God? His glory, his righteousness. You, we often talk about his holy love, his holy justice. What is this? Why do we use holiness as an adjective to some of his other attributes? Well, it's because holiness is his essence. So think of the sun. The sun has glory, and we'd call that the light. We see the sun, and it's producing light that gives life to all things. But at the center is fire. So God, we, we see his glory in all that he's made and what he's said and what he's done. But at the, the heart of it is God's holiness. That's the fire. This is who he is, his otherness. So then if we are called to be holy like God, as it says in verse 16, you shall be holy for I am holy. How does that apply to us if God is unique, unrivaled, and perfect in every way. Well, and I think that is where you get into the gospel. And so I've already said this commands are based on the indicatives, and they're in this passage right here in verses 14 through 16. So I want to bring those out to see there's only one way you can be holy like this God, which is this morally unstained, cleansed person who's useful to God. Let's, let's draw some of these out. There are five steps, you might say, that will show us how it is possible that we could be holy. Let's read here in verse 15. It starts with this. As he who called you is holy. Now, this term called isn't saying as he who commanded you is holy. This is a theological calling that is very synonymous with what we saw in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. 
The God who has called us has given us life and now called us then to holiness. He's actually made it possible. So before we just say, all right, I need to be holy, we're saying, oh wait, God has called us sovereignly to himself. The second thing we see here is at the beginning of this, verse 14. As obedient children. And we're saying, okay, wow, obedient children. Children of who? Look at verse 17. And if you call on him as father. So we're children of the father. But it's also stated very interesting here. It says, literally, as children of obedience. And if you're familiar with the Bible, you hear this term. It's a Hebraism. That is a Hebrew way of idiom, of talking. It is when you are speaking about the nature of someone. So in Ephesians chapter 2, we are children of wrath or children of disobedience. That is, we are characterized by this thing. But God, having born us again into a new family, has caused us to be children of obedience. That is an identity. That is not become children of obedience by starting to obey. He's saying you are children of obedience. This is it. This is who you are. It's an identity marker. So God has called us by grace, and then he's given us a new nature. We're children of obedience, and then we continue on. Look at this third step. That new birth that we've been given overcomes the spiritual blindness and ignorance here. It says, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. That means somehow we've been given new sight. We, at one point in time, were completely ignorant to the truths of God. We were alienated, lost, in darkness. But now, we are no longer in ignorance. We've been given truth to perceive the reality of what we're called to. The fourth step is we've been given new desires. We used to be in ignorance, and we'd act according to our passions that flowed from our ignorance, assuming now that if we're going to be holy, he's given us new desires in our hearts. We're no longer conforming ourselves to passions of our former ignorance. Now we've been given truth, and we've been given spiritual delights for the things of God. And then lastly here, this is this step. He says, be holy, for I am holy. Be holy in all your conduct. So I'm trying to pull out the fact that God has done something amazing for you to actually get to the place where you can be holy in all your conduct. He has called you to himself. He's brought you from death to life. He has given you a new nature so that now you are an obedient child. He has brought you from darkness, and he's given you now new passions and desires, which result in a desire to be holy in all your life. So, essentially, we're asking ourselves, what does it mean to be holy? We can't be completely other like God in the sense that he is unique, but we are to be reflecting his character of moral purity to the fallen world. And how do we do that? According to Peter, he says here, in verse 14, you got to let go of the former way of life. How do you think about your past before Christ? Do you glamorize it? Do you think, oh, that was fun? Do you say, oh, wow, I wish I could still do some of these old things? Or are you disgusted by the fact that you had lived in sin and disobedience to God? And you had hurt other people by your actions and you would hurt yourself, and you'd plunge yourself into misery, Are you, do you want to go back there? No, he's saying, let it all go. Don't be like Lot's wife who looked back. No, he says, let it go. Be holy now. You've been set free. New life, new desires, truth. Be holy as I am holy. Now, with that glorious reality, before us, that we no longer have to be conformed to the passions of our former ignorance, which in 1 Peter chapter 4 is described 
in this way, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Since that no longer delights us, what delights us? It is being holy like God. So I want to now, since we've gone through this passage, at least this part, I want to spend some time really thinking practically about this. I want to clarify some things, some misconceptions, some counterfeits of what holiness truly is. The rest of the letter, we are going to be seeing how this fleshes itself out practically. Peter, what does it mean to be holy like God is holy? We're going to see it all in the lifestyle issues, the attitudes and minds of the hearts, how we respond to unjust suffering, how we treat those who are hurting, how we respond to the laws and leaders of our government, how husbands and wives interrelate with one another. We're going to see all this in very practical and specific ways. We're going to spend a lot of time on it. But for now, I want to give you a couple things to prepare you for that, just to, to get thinking properly about holiness. We are here sitting in a church, and so we have to be on guard for what I like to call some counterfeits, okay? One is the insincere holiness. And this is that holiness where we think we are holy, but God knows our hearts and we're really not. And so we actually have impure motivations. We might be doing some of the right things, but it is not so that people would look upon us and say, wow, God has saved this person. God has changed them and brought them to life. And so God gets glory? No, we're doing these things so that we would impress other people and they'd think we're holy. That is what is called like an insincere, hypocritical holiness. <laughs> we have to be on guard for that. Organizing and doing things so that other people would see us. This, this, this does not please God. It's revolting in His sight. We have to watch out for this. And then another... It's just the counterfeit holiness that we sort of grab a, the holiness badge and sort of patch it on because we're not doing certain things or we don't look like other people. Let's look at a couple of these. There are some misconceptions about holiness. Holiness here first is not primarily an issue of style or fashion. Christianity has messed this thing up when we focus too much on True Christians dress this particular way or look this way. And uh, I'm not saying the Bible doesn't speak to anything about dress. We're not to be immodest or doing anything to intentionally seduce people by our clothing. But what I'm saying is there's a certain way of dressing in people's minds that is right. That's it. Anything else is immodest or anything else is you don't really care about holiness. I want to distance myself from that. And say, no, there's more to holiness than this. Another way people mess this up is uh, by being primarily concerned with choices relating to culture. So they will focus on, you know, which movies, either you can or can't watch movies, or which movies are acceptable and not. And of course, there are movies that you have to be on guard for, will dull your senses in terms of like your spiritual things. We talked about being sober-minded. What gets in the way of that? So you have to be on guard, but is it movies in general? And is it something where you can only watch, you know, Disney movies or, you know, certain types of movies? You have to say, no, holiness goes beyond that. Certain art is art, certain things. We've got to distance ourselves from that. What about uh, music? What type of music do true holy people listen to? With that, you have to say, okay, there are certain lyrics, obviously, in certain music that you probably are going to want to stay away from, and that they will dull your spiritual senses, right? But is holiness primarily related to choices related to culture? No, it's not. But these are some of the things that we can just hold on to. It's like, ah, I'm doing great. I'm being holy. And I want you to have a bigger view of this. Holiness has to do with the heart, being set apart in your heart, holy, devoted completely to God and wanting to reflect His character. So there are some particulars that deal specifically with this. And that is your sexual behavior. 
that means you might, if you desire holiness, have to stick out in our culture that by and large thinks you should be able to try the car out before marriage kind of thing. That mentality. According to the Word of God, we are to be pure in our sexuality. It means we, wa- we, we think about what we're taking in. Every, if everybody else is watching or looking or pointing and clicking on all sorts of things, you have to say, no, I'm taking a stand. I'm going to be set apart in my heart to God and pure. Holiness does have to do with excess. What are we overly consuming? Whether that's alcohol, drunkenness. I don't think the Bible prohibits alcohol to the point where you can't drink it at all. But drunkenness, definitely. How can you be sober-minded if you're drunk? Gluttony, slothfulness. Sobriety in these areas is a fruit of the Spirit. Self-control. A fruit of the Holy Spirit. Holiness has to deal with language. How do we speak? Are we using our tongues to tear down our brothers and sisters? Are we using them to edify and encourage and build up? Ephesians chapter 4, speaking the truth to one another in love so that we might all be built up. What are we looking at with our eyes Are we viewing sexually illicit material? Jesus speaks of lust. You know, people think, okay, I'm not cheating on my wife, or I'm not cheating on my spouse, I'm fine. But you're looking at things that Jesus equates to adultery. He says you're lusting in your heart. People can't see that. I can't see what's going on in you know, when you show up to church. That stuff is in your heart, and it's causing you to be impure and defiled. Finances means being meticulously honest with your finances. Everything you do before the Lord, you want to do in a way that pleases Him, including how you spend money. How you do your taxes. Holiness is all about how closely you resemble Jesus Christ. It's not about just not doing certain things related to a certain cultural bubble, a subculture of Christianity. It is about your heart being transformed by God's grace and saying, I get to reflect the beauty of Jesus in my life. Now, I'm going to say one more thing about holiness. And I think in support of this, I think I have the entire Word of God, all of church history, and the support of every single Christian who has ever lived. And so if you want to disagree with me, think about it. Holiness is a community effort. Holiness is not saying, okay, I'm going to do this now, and it's just me and my Bible. You should be reading your Bible, and you should be praying to the Lord, and you should be depending on Him. But the Scriptures teach that holiness comes about as you are intimately, intricately connected to a local church. Why do I say that? Hebrews 3 Verse 13, exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 10, 24, and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. 1 Thessalonians 5, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Holiness does not come from isolating yourself from other believers, but rather it comes as we place ourselves beneath the means of grace in a community that holds us accountable. We have six people this evening Wanting that type of accountability by entering into membership. And they're saying, 
guys, I'm not just joining a church so I can go do what I'm supposed to do and have, you know, enjoy my Sunday mornings. I'm coming in because I want to be a disciple of Christ and I want to mature in holiness and I want you all to hold me accountable to that. And so we bust out of here on Sunday after we've encouraged each other, we've heard from the Word of God, and then we gather again in gospel communities throughout the week. Some of us come back this evening for prayer because we know that being a part of this body is what's going to cause us and transform us by to being holy because as we gather with one another we share the gospel with one another we proclaim the holiness of god we speak about our identity in christ our hope for the future we share our burdens our hardships and each one of us can point each other how are we supposed to be thinking god is in sovereign over your trials he's working something in you through this don't worry about the future it's secure in Christ. You've been kept. This is what we do as believers. This is what a, a healthy, robust community does. So I must ask you, are you thinking of the church this way? That I want to be holy and so I want to be involved in this community. And I know it's COVID area, so, era, so like my people on live stream, I'm not trying to point you out and like, okay, you're disconnected from us. No, I'm asking people here, are you purposely isolating yourself from the community or being loosely connected to the church on purpose? And if so, what does that tell you about your desire for holiness? I want each of us not to be thinking about this church in terms of, man, I want my preferences to be met perfectly. I want everything to be just right. I want it to be easy. I want your passion and hunger for holiness to push you to saying, I want more of the community. I want more Bible. I want more preaching. I want more theology. I want more pastoral care. I want all of this so that I might grow in holiness. That's what I want to see. That's what all of our pastors are praying for. That this desire for being like God in holiness would end in our church being a passionate, vibrant community who loves each other, who's interdependent. We depend upon one another for our very maturity in life. All right, so hope. We have two commands. We're not going to get to the third one. The other one is be reverent before God. We will pick that up as we go. But so far, hope. Set your hope fully on the grace of God. Don't be caught up in divided hopes or being lethargic in your thinking, but be prepared for action and be holy. Be holy. How do you do that? Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but instead be holy like God is holy. How do you do that? Well, you see what he's done. He's called you. He's given you the truth of his word. He's given you new desires. And he's given you a community of believers to live this thing out with. That, brothers and sisters, is glorious. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for pointing out the glory and beauty of what it means to be holy. And for giving us the engine of the whole thing. That therefore, all that you've done for us now propels us to a life of holiness, of hope, of reverence. And we see that that life is not lived out alone. You've brought us together. Even this morning is fruit of that. And we are hearing from you through the preaching of the word. We are praying to you, led by pastors. We are going to speak to one another now in fellowship and encourage one another and see how people are doing. We're going to weep with those who weep. We're going to rejoice with those who rejoice. All these things is brought about by your greatness, your glory. May we not be self-inclined. May we not be focused on what everybody else can do for us. But may we be servant-hearted, wanting to connect ourselves to one another so that we might Share truth with one another. Admonish the idle. 
Bear the burdens of one another. Speak truth in love so it might be all built up in Christ, in maturity. So I pray now as we respond together in song, that would come from a heart that has been transformed. That isn't just saying, I, not, I need to do this because I know it's right, but that truly desires to please you, to think and sing about the greatness of the salvation we have bought to us by Christ and to respond with holiness in our lives. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.